Here we are, friends, another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, where today we have Tomas. Hello. And our regularly scheduled co-host, Travis. <laughs> as well as me, Jason. You can find me on the discords as Fay. Here to talk about growing our local scenes and running into trouble at our local tournaments. Yes, Which we are you? going to definitely be talking about um, some sportsmanship and uh, just kind of like game etiquette stuff as well as kind of the topic of the day. And the reason why we're doing this is because Tomas got called out at Adepticon for uh, being one of the most sportsmanlike players. I believe there is an article on Goonhammer where all three of the top three players, including uh, Leander, who was on the podcast, and uh, called out Tomas as a great sportsman. It, it was very uh, odd. I mean, I was like, why is, is this article that technically has nothing to do about me <laughs> mentioning me <laughs> three times? Hey, man, if you put in the reps and you make the impression, it's a people people will remember you. That's part of the fun of playing an in-person game. That's why we love it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Being a good sport is a very important thing. I like when it comes to because I also play 40K and when it comes to sportsmanship, that's always been my number one thing is just like 40K and sometimes kill team is a game of trust where. You know, if you're going down and going, oh, well, actually, you're 1.0001 inches out, so you're not getting cover. It's like, but I had six inches and I used two inches of my movement. Like, we all know where I went there and the board has been shifted two times and the barricade fell over. It's like, the game is, you can't keep it in a perfect state. So you have to have the trust and like the sportsmanship side of things or else it's just chaos. Agreed. Yeah, it's true. Playing in real life means that, you know, you're going to be at that table with someone for two hours. If you're going to be a jerk, you're just kind of like ruining the experience for everybody involved. Yeah. And really winning while being a jerk, it's like you're not really winning. You're just kind of making other people frustrated. That's that's another thing that's me. It's pretty huge. Like even when it comes to being open about rules, you know, I'm not going to be there and play the game for you, obviously. But, you know, if you go all right, I'm going to put this guy so that he's in, uh, he's outside of charge distance thinking it's the typical six plus two inches, but it's like, oh, well, no, I'll, don't forget I'm playing Phobos. And uh, even though it's a strategic ploy, you best believe I'm using Vanguard every turn, especially now. Yeah, so, yeah. I think one of my common policies is um, letting people know that there might be a gotcha, but not telling them exactly what the gotcha is. And if they ask questions, I'll be like, okay, this is what it is. Cause it's like, if you don't ask any questions, like if you're not curious, I'm not going to give you the answer. Cause it is your job to ask the questions. However, once you ask the question, I'm like, yeah, this is the rule right here. Or if people are like, can you just tell me if it's a charge thing? I'm like, yeah, it's like, you know, you can't move this thing. Or like if the locust is sitting around a corner, it's like, mm -hmm. if you move within three inches, I'm going to jump you. Or like the dogs, it's like, I'm going to put this on engage for a reason. And if you ask me, <laughs> if they forget, they forget. Because sometimes like, you know, I, the gotcha is hard to pull off with like a crude hound. So it's like, yeah. sometimes I'm like, I'll set it up. And if you forget, you forget. But I will make sure that I'm like, I'm going to put this on engage. They're like, that's weird. I'm like, it is weird. It's like, if you make the mistake, like, hey, you know, mistakes happen. I, I can have all the information in the world and still make stupid, dumb plays. Yeah. Uh, it's just, you know, like, I mean, even uh, when I played John from uh, Goonhammer at Adepticon, we knew that it was like the top four at that point, And John was playing uh, Wormblade and I was playing Phobos. And so we're like, we were, we had lunch. It's like okay, well, we're probably going to get paired up against each other, and if not, one of the other players is intercession. <laughs> you know, we all know what that does. So we just sat down during lunch and just had a conversation about what our armies does, and it made the game flow so much better. Yeah, that's like a pair of team that's like Gotcha Cities on the first yes. game because Phobos have like the ability to look at someone and stun them. So if you're not an eye line, you can't get Omni scrambled. Wormblade have hiding, which lets them like flip all their orders. And all sorts of other crazy stuff, if anyone has ever played against Wormblade. So. Yeah, like all the different characters have all these different things, and they can basically, uh, they can like heroically intervene, basically, where they like, it's not even their activation and they well, charge into you. It's not even quite heroically intervention, right? It's like the dork comes in and suicides for the hero. So it's like <laughs> reverse intervention. It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like a red shirt, like, oh God, I gotta get in the way. <laughs> Just it's gets uh, Mr. Presidencing. That moves. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like those guys are the important ones. So everyone else will sacrifice himself for him. And yeah, like that's that was like the thing, especially uh, 
you know, let's be honest here, up until the balanced data slate, Phobos wasn't actually seen all that often. And yep, they were rough to play. <laughs> they, they, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, they were. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of my opponents just flat out were like, yeah, and I played against Phobos one time when they came out, you know, which at this point is almost a year ago. Yeah. It's like, that's, that's, it's rough for anyone to remember something like that. Yeah. Especially all but the most insane players would, you know, be hard pressed to remember every single rule that a Phobos team has. Yes. And they, they've got lots of rules now, especially with free actions. Yes, and there were yes. so many options there that, like, definitely anyone that was playing them, like, in, you know, in New York and someone playing them in Minnesota was almost definitely going to have, like, a completely different style. Like, someone might be like, oh. well, I'm going to do pure infiltrators, and someone might be like, I'm going to do pure reavers, and that's, like, a very different experience. Oh, yeah, even going, like, the pure incursors. I tried that once, and it's just hilarious you just spend the whole game outside of two inches of every single heavy terrain you can possibly think of and just go yep. i'm gonna shoot you with a really crappy gun but you won't be able to shoot me back yeah i've That's definitely done that, that with uh with hunter clade hunter clade back pre <laughs> post buff post pre nerf yep in the middle phase you have to do that a lot with the arquebus to actually get any use out of it so mm. Yeah, abusing obscuring was a really big thing. For listeners who don't know, the Phobos incursors are the ones with the cameras on their backpacks instead of the antennas, and they can ignore obscurity now. Yeah, it's, just it's beautiful. It, it was a, the at Adepticon they were putting the the oil rig mm -hmm. piece of Octarius in the middle, the normally giant box of obscuring and uh, heavy cover, but. It has a bunch of gaps in it, which normally doesn't matter, unless you're Phobos. Yep. It's like, oh, this is actually like a the the most disgusting one way obscurement you can possibly think of. Oh yeah, Chalneth is like that too, but they didn't have oh, that in Adepticon. Right. But yeah, like anytime there's Chalneth and I'm playing Phobos, I'm like, oh, let's get the incursors out. <laughs> let's go yeah i do think it's really nice that phobos is one of the bespoke teams where the roster selection actually does m play a big difference in like how you oh, approach yeah. matchups because it's basically kind of soft gone away i think you know there might be a handful of teams that actually care about rosters like warp coven because your sorcerer selection uh legionary because there's a handful of like extra operatives you might take but if you look at teams like star striders or Crute or most teams you're just playing everything and there's not really that much option but phobos you step on the field you look at the map and you're like which of my three kinds of operatives do i need to spam yeah it, it's a weird math formula where you're trying to figure out like which what is like the best value for you know the map and your opponent you know, so how did like, you approach that when in your games and how did you like approach it while also somehow remaining the most sportsmanlike player of all time so I'll be honest, I found out that like in 90% of situations, I could run the same comp and get very similar results. Um, so it was a Reaver Sergeant, which has no gotchas whatsoever. It is just, you know, everything's on, on the tin. It is yep, just hit, hits on two, shoots on twos, is scary in melee and guns. <laughs> Angry and, man and running at people. Yep. And terror. It's like, nice and easy. Uh, mm -hmm. I would run one Reaver Warrior, and those two were just like my flanking units that I would go tie stuff up with. Like on open board, they would have like the grapple hook and the grab shoot to just be anywhere they want very quickly for either vantage or, you know, securing those turn one objectives. Um, and then, so like I, I would just about always bring those two. I would always bring the Incursor Marksman because the best damage dealer on your team. Uh, and then I'd usually bring the Infiltrator Veteran. So like those four I brought, I think, every single game. And then, actually, you know, the fifth one, I forgot the, the one that I did not switch out the whole tournament, even on the, the like Thursday RTTs was uh the incursor mine layer that guy oh, is interesting the one so that, good the one that now stuns mid movement right yes okay yeah because uh, for listeners who don't know there's two different mine laying uh models on the phobos team there's a saboteur who has to physically press a button 
who is not great because he has to you have to baby him basically it's really and easy to the, work around it too yeah and then the yes. incursor mine layer just drops a mine and he can run away and if anyone walks within two inches of the mine it stuns him and they stop mid movement and just <laughs> the, don't do anything it's like better than stun because it full-blown like interrupts your activation yes because it it it's really good into uh, on into the dark where you know, oftentimes you can have one of your six operatives babysitting an objective to make sure that random, you know, Necron, uh, uh, what are they Bug called? Bug doesn't like shrimp. scuttle over, basically. Yeah. Or like, <laughs> you know, random worm blade operative and stuff like that. So it's just like you throw one of those on there and you go, you're going to need to send at least two guys here because you can position it in such an easy way uh, that they can't end on the objective without it blowing up it's like you can't even get through the door without just like getting yeah. stuck right and then you just sit there and go this objective is basically safe because if you're sending two operatives there either you've already won or it's a desperation play to st to try to stop me from winning either way it's usually a win-win for me uh and so i would just do that every game is one of my backfield objectives would have that mine and then you know whether it's secure or uh, capture, it's like that objective is safe for the rest of the game. Like loot's a little weird, but the way I use loot was a little bit more aggressive, where kind of like what you were saying is I would use it to instead block a door. It's like, sure, go through this door, be stuck in the middle of the open, and let me shoot you. So you found Phobos to be much improved on In the Dark because I before the patch I felt like they were almost not playable on In the Dark. That's what that was my opinion. I don't know how you felt before they the patch. They were they were hard on Into the Dark. They were very unforgiving. This is just the team as a whole, and you know, elites yeah. in general are unforgiving. Um, but the way I played on Into the Dark is before like the patch. Now it's even easier, so I'm glad they got the update. Is just shenanigans with movement and uh, door closing and opening. You know, I'd go through and purposely uh make it so that i will you know charge up the board steal your objective with a reaver and close the door behind me so you're probably not going to get there and if you do get there i have some time to react um like when i played uh probably one of my toughest matches was the worm blade uh and i mean it was a 2019 loss Oof. And what I ended up doing was um, deploying everything down pretty evenly. Saw how he deployed where he put his uh, the the, his, the locus. His two cult agents, yeah. And I went okay, and I just redeployed half of my army to the other side of the board, and all I left was like the the mine layer who turned one secured the objective threw mine down and then ran away and it's like he was now forced to like slowly send his locus and uh the rest of his guys across the board and i'm a lot faster and uh if it weren't for the fact that i made a mistake on the last turn it would have ended with a 2020 tie but uh based off of tiebreakers i would have won thing and that is a heartbreaker yeah I, I it was one of those things that like i tried to kill an operative to secure like a uh, an objective and i you know did i whiffed on the roll and lost the game because of it and then later on you know shower thoughts moments i went wait a second i didn't even need to shoot him i just needed to charge him if i tied him up the game was over like oh i'm an idiot <laughs> Uh, the three to two APL uh, sitting on a point. Yeah, yeah. It was just like I just I, I didn't need to do anything. Like this was a guaranteed thing. That's that's you know one of the reasons why I liked Phobos is that generally because you don't have reliable rerolls and you don't have reliable like one shotting guns. Even your marksman is not the best at one shotting high toughness models. Uh, I just view it as I never expect to kill you in the most efficient way so i just don't worry about it yeah just kind of yeah. work your whole game plan around scoring and and like 
don't really take it so personally or like set your expectations that the kills are not going to happen and it's a bonus when it does. Yeah, exactly. I think if when I, I tested Phobos, that, that was a, that's where I realized, wow, having rerolls is really nice because Phobos <laughs> just have no, there's no access to anything. You're just, I'm there's just rolling dice nothing. and I just hitting on threes. And people think hitting on threes is great. It's like with four dice, it's like, no, you yeah. might get two hits, you might get three hits. Yeah, like, any, okay. any 40k player that comes to play Kill Team goes, oh, hitting on threes, that's great. You know, that's okay. super solid. It's like, yeah, but with four dice, averages don't mean anything. Yeah, variability it can be very high. Like, it is, you will generally hit a little bit more, you'll generally save a little bit more, but woof. Phobos was the first time re I realized, I was like, man, playing just naked dice is real spooky. Yes. And so that's why I was like, oh, I, if I just assume I'm always going to fail at <laughs> shooting stuff, I just won't shoot. Yeah, and I think one of those critical mistakes I saw when Phobos first got released is people talking about like all the shooting models. And I play them like I think like three or four games. I'm like, I think I just want to take like three or, like three Reavers, at least back then. I think they yeah. improved enough now where you can take some more shooting units and you can have options. But like when they first released, the Reavers were the only model that could almost always do something because you, you yeah, charge the, someone, you can actually win a fight. Yes, the I, I ran yeah. into the problem of. Uh, I, a, I didn't have enough Reavers, and of I brought a total of three Reavers because I have like a whole display board with uh, where they all sit in water resin, so they all have their own slot. So adding operatives to that doesn't work. You have to add out like a new display board attachment. Yeah, to exactly. display board. <laughs> and so, and I was stupid, and I was like, oh, I'll just in case they change them, I built one of my Reavers with a bolt carbine. <laughs> It's the, like, wrong, the wrong direction to have the conversion, right? Correct. Yeah, it's just like, oh, wait, this is pointless. Yeah, um, I've got a couple of those, too. Yeah, I, I have so a set of I've got a set of nine Reavers and like three of them have the skull mask. So or they have like melee weapons. So I'm like, those three are my Reavers. Yep. Yep. I, I, I love Reavers in general. Like for my 40K army, I run 30 of them like a madman. I love that. And <laughs> I love that for you. But it's it's not good, but it works. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so it's like, you know, I, I ended up doing that, but I 100% agree. Up until the point where uh, the uh, incursors could ignore obscuring, there was all their shooting sucked. Yeah. They, you had like, one good model, and that was the incursor marksman, and that was four attacks on twos. 3-4, AP-1, lethal 5. Final, like, yep. that was, we were like, all right, this is good. I, I like, shot a guardsman one time. I was like, oh, I didn't kill it. <laughs> Just yeah. saved me. I was like, yeah, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing with this gun. I, I ran into that, like, so many times, uh, where it's just like, oh, I'm shooting my best gun into a literal guardsman, and yeah. it doesn't kill them. And not because, you know, I rolled, like, absolute garbage. It was just like, oh, I rolled one below, and they rolled one above, and next thing you know, they survived it's or even like, they just they just have to block one shot and they're like oh i took six i'm like yeah, yeah you're right you did take six i guess he lives and uh now my marine is gonna die to this return fire plasma yeah exactly so i was just like you know the the thing that got them was the ignore obscuring completely that mm -hmm. led to a lot of just they phobos are not a fun play a game or fun team to play into just because they have so many weird gotcha moments that's... that's true they are one of the gotcha teams kind of like Wormblade or harlequins there's a lot yeah. of rules where if you don't understand why your opponent is doing something it's going to look very weird and then your opponent's going to explain it to you mid-turn when you try to do something and you're like ah crap yeah. i think novitiates also have that moment where you're like i'm going to jump on top of this vantage you like shoot and they're like i only have one legal target uh i guess i'm Why just anymore? stuck here <laughs> yeah you're yeah. just like trapped on top of the advantage you're like uh i guess i die and they're like yeah i guess you die yeah, correct <laughs> you just take a crossbow bolt straight to the head and you collapse or on the floor the super plasma pistol like yeah. it, it's so that that was the thing that like especially on open board i was taking advantage a lot of with uh just overall and their mobility let me you know, I was using Vanguard just about every turn before the buff, just for that extra inch and the free traverse. Yeah, even on into the dark, you would never you not use it now. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it, it, you are using that minimum three or four turns. Yeah. But... Yeah. For uh, for players who don't know or people who've never seen Phobos, um, Tomas is talking about their most important strategic ploy because it's been buffed now, so you basically always use it. And it's you ignore the first two inches of movement penalties. Yep. 
And then you get an extra inch of movement. And then you pass all jump tests. And now, with most recent patch, you also get a free mission action for everyone. Yep. Yep. So it that is. could be like loot, it could be open doors. Yep. It's just a free mission action. So all of your Phobos Marines are now incredibly sneaky, incredibly fast, incredibly mission dewy. But you still got 12 wounds and 3 up save, so you take a plasma, you die. Yeah, that's... I, I honestly, before the patch came out, I, I wanted just, like, one wound. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I, I think the, the break point was, like, 12 felt like not enough. But now with the now with the extra action, you don't have to sit on points ever. Because on loot, oh, now yeah. you can just have a dude, like, move out, press a button, and then just run away. And it's yeah. it's fine. <laughs> and being able to do stuff like strategize with the uh, the leader to get you plus one CP was... Yeah, that used to be awful because you're like, okay, I got to move, open a door, strategize. And it's like he moved six inches and that's it. That's yeah. so bad. <laughs> yeah. So what you you mentioned the first four operatives or your final two operatives. What did you pivot between? Did you use the medical oh, lot? Did you use the so, saboteur every now and then for certain missions, like maybe against elites? Or what was your what were your final two? The fifth one I forgot as the auto include was the mine layer because he's just oh, okay. busted. Okay. Uh he is now, I think, the best operative on the team just because of his usefulness. The super uh, stun. Yeah, the super stun. Uh, and then most of the time, it was bringing the medic. Um, you know, so you had a like lot of we, matches where you were getting into shootouts, or yep. you just thought the like the healing was really useful. the The healing was really useful, and uh, it would put stuff like, "Oh, I'm going to send my." vet guard plasma gunner to be within two inches of your leader so i'll blast him and i'm like yeah but my medic's right there and it's like oh wait so like those those easy like even if my medic did nothing the presence of the medic was enough to cause my opponent to play maybe not optimally but make incorrect decisions yeah um, that makes a lot of sense because it's like medics? oh yeah sure you can kill him I'll just revive him, and then you'll lose your plasma gunner. Yeah, like, in our oh. in our game at a uh, kill team open, we had some interesting medic shuffling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that that game was uh, that game was so so hilarious. So for <laughs> we, we, me and Tomas played at kill team open, and we played Star Striders versus Star Striders. I think on like the very first play, there's this thing that you do with the rotor cannon and the medic because it's kind of free in most games. But we were looking at the board. I'm like, oh, I can't do this because. It, I'll get I'll get artillery blasted if I do this play because the medic has to be within three inches, and one of the Star Striders blast templates is um, a frag grenade with three inch blast. And we're sitting there like, hmm, that's weird. I'm gonna have to do this very differently. <laughs> like set up to shoot and then dash away, fully out of line of sight. It was a very odd game, just because I had never practiced against it, and I'm like, this is I, what what do I do here? I'm like. Yeah. Yeah, my brain expanded like two times that day because I was like, oh, my God, I have to like I have to watch for my opponent's blast while I'm also yeah. doing my blast lineups because we're supposed to be in there like we both have the same weapon. But if one of us messes up, it's going to be like a laser beam that neither of us was expecting because neither of us was thinking about it the right way. It's, yeah, it's it's a weird matchup, though. Yeah. I, haven't, I haven't played them much since the new changes, yeah, uh, mostly just because I've been grinding on that Phobos because. Like, I mean, you're but, grinding that sportsmanship. So you want to yeah. talk about you want to talk about how you like. What did you? What do you think that you did at Adepticon that really got everyone to kind of say that you know Tomas was like my favorite opponent? Do you think it was just like talking all your gotchas out, or was it you know what so, happened? I think that well, you know, one a lot of people already had a positive uh, mentality playing against me because they're like, oh, dude, you're bringing Phobos. Like, either you're a madman or you know, you have no idea what's going on. Um, and so, you know, being able to go through and be like, oh, wait, no, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. And he's like willingly doing Phobos. A lot of people were just like already in a good mood because of that, because it was a nice, fun matchup, even if they weren't winning. And then, yeah, I just talked through a lot of my game. Um, you know, when I'm placing barricades, I will tell you exactly what it's there for. It's like this barricade is to make sure that if you try to get on this objective, you have to go either over or around the barricade or this barricade will give me exactly enough room for one guy to fit on it. And that's it. Um, which, you know, then sp it speeds up the game um, because then you're not having to worry about, Oh, 
wait, you know, this got knocked over and now I don't know, you know, how much room there was. It's like, it doesn't matter. Just put it down. We know one guy can fit there. We can adjust accordingly. And that's like my, you know, attitude in general. Um, I definitely have a player in my local area that will say things, but then he won't like demonstrate it. And then it gets a little bit spicy sometimes. So for anyone who's like involved or like wants to play in tournaments, it's like, there is a lot of physical tricks you can do with physical geometry. I think Tomas is talking about like putting a barricade two inches away from an objective. So your opponent like can't physically stand on that side. They have to like traverse over. Is that yep. something that you tried doing? All right. Yep. Doing stuff like that or, you know, making it so that um, I'll put a barricade closer to a wall so that my model can fit through. But your Geller Pox mutant can't. Yeah, um, and it's really important during setup. You can actually like physically demonstrate with a yep. barricade because you can say that it's physically possible, but if your opponent doesn't see it, you're not going to have an agreement. So it's really easy. Just like, all right, you know, I'm just going to make sure that we're both clear. I'm going to put this barricade in this hallway. I'm going to show that the 40 millimeter gets stuck and the 32 can go through. Obviously, it's doable, but it's always good to just show your opponent. Like, if you're going to shortcut, you got to at least, if your opponent questions you, just show the math basically yeah you, you got to show your work on this it's like a uh, high school math all over again yeah uh, we're, we're just in geometry class all over again yeah. and and that's the thing i would just literally ask for the model and be like can i borrow your model for a second and then be like okay see how this doesn't fit and they go yep and i go excellent yeah the big takeaway there is definitely just like very thorough communication i mean just like making sure everyone knows what's going on everyone's on the same page um then like and like you know it it comes with experience to know what to do- what to talk about because like if you know if you don't really know that's going to come up then you can't talk about it but like if you do and you talk about it ahead of time there's not going to be an argument when it comes up and just like being clear and like easy to understand um really adds to the fun um people you know if if people feel caught off guard it can kind of they can get tilted and uh you're just yeah. avoiding that with com- with good communication it's one of those things that's like, well, you know, we we already talked about this. So you, it, it's like the gotcha moment where you forgot it. It's like, that's just your fault at that point. You know, two minutes ago, I reminded you I can, you know, get on this uh, thing for, for uh, ignore the traverse. It's like, you know, and at that point, it's like, yeah, they got, you know, they messed up. But at least they know at that point, it's just, you know, it wasn't their opponent taking advantage of them. Yeah, yeah. People, I've, I've definitely had games where it's like someone did something and I was like, that's interesting and i went to roll dice and they were like wait why and i was like i mean you already rolled the dice <laughs> like if you didn't ask it's like uh we're already at rolling dice once once you've rolled dice i won't let really people take too much back sometimes if there's like i made a mistake and they let me take something back i like all right we'll rewind up to x point because it feels like both of us got a little bit of something and that yep. that's definitely happened before because someone's shot at an invuln save model with an ap gun and i was like that's weird but they rolled the dice and then i was like all right i have an invuln save and they're like wait what it's like, uh. it's like you shot you know, at the assassin she has an invuln save i don't know what to say that's another thing that like i i, I tell most of my opponents like hey i'm gonna just ask you a lot of questions yeah i might know the answer already but i'm gonna double check to make sure yeah you if know. people confidently make the mistake i will confidently let them make the mistake is yeah. kind of my uh my personality with it because it's like i'm totally down to like talk out a lot of stuff but if we're both in the moment and we're both like we confidently make a mistake i'm like well okay we're both we're both stupid sometimes and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that it's okay to make mistakes together yeah and that's a, you know making mistakes is one thing you know and then but it, it's all about like the not letting it drag you down like i when i played against the wormblade player i left my marksman out a little bit too much out in the open mm-hmm. and i got i got punished so hard because he sent a crack grenade at it Oof. and it one shot my marksman turn two, like activation two and i'm like oh was no. that a cult ambush crack grenade no no <laughs> it's just a naked <laughs> crack grenade huh it was like he rolled like all hits or it was like two crits two hits and i rolled uh with the re-roll all ones <laughs> nice congrats and it's just like huh well, love, that, love that for our marines yeah. it's important to remember everybody hitting on threes is just hitting on threes it doesn't mean you're guaranteed anything yeah. and it's just like okay this game has changed slightly and you know being able to just take that and accept that well it's happened you know 
uh, is is a really good like keeping a positive mental attitude is very important. Also, it just keeps you from getting tired. Like yeah. there will be times where I'm like going to a local tournament, and I'm just like not in a good mood, and it's like, oh, this is so draining. Whereas, like you know, if you're going in with a positive attitude, being you know v- very open with your communication, and you know looking to have more of a good time, then most of your opponents will have a good time also. Even if you're beating them. Yeah, just that uh, yeah, energy I mean, feedback. Yeah, and uh and the New Mexico tournament last year, I think me and Carlos were having a game where the board was not set up really in a way that Breachers had a good chance against Pathfinders, and he got very, very upset <laughs> for the first like hour that we were playing. We had four hour time blocks in New Mexico. Oh that's and I just, right. I just let him like ride it out because I, I just went there to play for fun and like took Pathfinders into a mixed tournament. So it's not like, it wasn't like I was going in with the most competitive mindset. I was like, I'm just gonna try this, and I definitely could have pressured him into like sticking to what he said. <laughs> and I think it might have gone a little differently, but that wasn't really why I went to play in that tournament. And that's not really why I go to play any tournaments, um, unless sometimes you run into your your rivals and you've played against each other a couple times. You're like. Nah, you made that mistake. I'm going to hold you to it. That's fine because oh, yeah. it's like you know each other. If you have history, like if I see you in another game, Tomas, and we both like we both miss, it's like, all right, I guess we both suck. <laughs> We're just going to take We're just it. We're bad at this on. game. Yeah, it happens all the time. I've gotten straight into play and forgotten reveal tack ops many times. Oh, I mean that's what happened in our game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's totally as long as everyone is on the same page. Like, oh, I guess you know, it's just a game. We're not really like it's fine to be competitive, but being a jerk is a different thing. <laughs> And, you know, there is the caveat of, like, you know, make sure, you know, and this comes with experience that, you know, also, you know, keep an eye out for someone trying to push your good faith and good attitude. You know, I haven't run into this in Kill Team, but in 40k, I definitely have where someone has been like, oh, can I take this back? Like, you know, when I've been pretty generous about take backs and I was like, it was like one of those things was like three phases ago. I'm like, no, you can't take yeah. this back. And he's yeah. like, oh, really? You're going to be like that? I'm like, are you, are you trying to pressure me to <laughs> let you go back three phases when there's been, you know, about 10 different dice rolls? And, no, thank you. Yeah. Luckily and, in Kill Team, it's it's nice because our we don't have as much like, not as much stuff happens in between turns. Yep. So my general rule, and I think it's a good one, is if you roll dice, it's too late. Like if you're... You finish an activation and you've done everything and you roll dice, you're not taking it back. Those dice are on the table. One of the things I had to do for the tournament was, you know, with uh, uh, terror on the Reavers being free, uh-huh. every activation, I'm like, okay, I'm going to start off and do terror. They're like, you're not even near an objective. Like, I don't care. I'm just trying to remember it. Exactly. <laughs> like... <laughs> It's not even like for uh, you know gameplay purposes. I am just not trying to you know be that guy that goes, oh crap, I forgot terror, and that completely changes the turn. Um, so it's just you know get into those good habits, you know. As long yeah, as you're one, not you know wasting one thing I've time. done with um, one thing I've started doing with ploys is if you have a hard time remembering ploys, keep the ploy page up and then just put dice on whichever strap ploys you turn on. So at least you have like some visual representation. Which oh I think yeah, helps. I make actual little cards. So like yeah. I print it out and I sleeve it and then I put it on top of like a real playing card. And then I the ones that are not active are face down and the ones that are active are face up. Nice. Yeah, especially in a you know oh it's round eight of a you know eight round tournament. You're like I did I use double shoot this turn or did I use it last turn? It's like as long as you you know are good with you know making sure to flip your cards back over every turn you're good <laughs> mm-hmm. uh same thing with like uh the whatchamacallit's the the different uh ancillary supports from oh star yeah, striders star striders you can only use yeah. one, one of them each turn you or one of them one. over two turns basically yeah and it can't be in the same turn in a row it's like okay but wait did i use the shell last turn or did i not use it and i use it turn one it's like just fi- find find a way and kind of like going back to that communication thing it's just like tell your opponent like hey i'm gonna do this this is kind of what it represents and this is to help me remember it so you know that way when you're fiddling around with your you know uh 
uh what is the ba battle fleet gothic model and they're like what the heck are you doing it's like okay no this yeah. is actually for a reason <laughs> Not about the size of the ship anyways, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. As shown by <laughs> our game. Oh, uh, goodness. Those are fun games. Anyways, you have a tournament coming up in your area, or are you... How, how have a... You're setting up a tournament, trying to set up a tournament in your area, yeah? You want to talk uh, about your local scene a little bit? Yeah, so uh, we... Uh, I am out of the Albuquerque area, so, you know, very close to where the narrative was last year for those who went. Um, and... We uh, we have a pretty sizable kill team community, though they're not very much into tournaments. Like I'm the only one that goes to larger events, um, but uh, they overall. Um, so like we'll have events about. It'll go from like oh we're gonna have one every month to like oh we'll do it quarterly, but uh, so I don't run the tournaments mostly because. Uh, I kind of <laughs> made an agreement with my other 40k friend where I'll run the 40k events if he runs the kill team events. Oh, uh, so you get a chance to practice and he gets a chance. To, like exactly. both of you both get to play. Exactly. Yeah. And uh but unfortunately our local store did have to cancel our event. Uh so we don't know when it's going to be rescheduled to. Um but with that, you know, we have one of the things that I've been learning is because uh, I've moved from West Virginia, Maryland. So I've lived in several different locations and obviously now New Mexico. And that each community is different and they'll want different things. Um, even amongst the like... Uh, I think even in like internal communities, every, there's yeah. like there's always a lot of different pressures. Like I think we have like a new growing Necromunda group in New York and there's a ton of Necromunda players right now. So I'm sure I'm sure it's all over the place. Yeah, and one of the things I found out was, you know, I came from a community in West Virginia that was very competitively minded. You know, if there was an event, it was most likely going to be a tournament. Um, and we had them, you know, fairly often. And when I came to New Mexico, they're like, no, we'd rather just do like narrative events. I'm like, oh, okay. This is weird for me. Uh, same thing with Maryland. Maryland had a, you know, a lot more competitively minded. Uh, compared to new mexico and so you know uh a lot of players i mean we have i think we're doing a narrative league right now that has like i forget the exact number but i think it might be like around like 30 people wow Pretty and good. it's just like okay you know this is all soccer. this is all narrative kill team yeah narrative kill team bang that's super impressive um and uh my friend riggan runs it and he does a great job with it but you know we'll run a tournament and we'll get like eight to 12 people um just because you know the vast majority of the community goes no i just want to you know build you know run the narrative you know create ridiculously overpowered uh kill teams which is hilarious you know you can pull off some wonky stuff in narrative. have you guys tried doing maybe like a narrative tournament for a day like a narrative event day instead of doing regular tournaments just like uh you build a new roster you get a couple upgrades every turn and then at the end of the day someone is super buff but you still kind of have the tournament structure to kind of like average out between a really competitive scene and a less competitive scene i actually haven't so we we did talk about at the end of our last campaign doing like a all right we're gonna run a tournament and just bring whatever 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 upgrades you brought from the narrative but then we realized that there was like too much disparity and stuff like that so we're like ah, yeah. we'll 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 shelf that idea but i really like that yeah the, that's what we we've done that for the new york open kind of like an accelerated narrative structures so that lets people bring in new teams still get some narrative play and i think that's done pretty well i think at kto there was something similar where like every round you were basically always guaranteed a, a little bit of an upgrade and that way at the end of three rounds everyone got a chance to like level up some people get injuries and then you know you still get all the fun but you and then for you you get a little bit of a tournament so you kind of like edge find out which people were like oh the tournament was really cool maybe we should do a tournament again mm -hmm. and you know you feed both sides yeah, that's, a, that's what we did. We did similar for 40k. We did, uh, uh, we do like 2v2, like fun events where it's like you bring a thousand points and your friend brings a thousand points, and then, uh, you know, they're like, oh, wow, tournaments are fun. It's like, yeah, now sign up for a 2000 point super sweaty tournament. <laughs> and then, you know, that's ended up, you know, growing the community. Uh, it's just, you know, give the people what they want. 
You know, you can only force your, uh, even as the TO or local judge or whatever you want to call it, uh, you can only force your, uh, uh, not say beliefs, but your, oh, uh, your types of gameplay on two people. It's like, sometimes yeah, I, you just got to bite the bullet and go, you know what? Narrative it is. You have to meet people where they are. So like, I've, I'm lucky in New York, we have a pretty competitive community, but we also, I think a big part for the New York uh, scenes kind of like, um, strength is that if there's a new player all the more experienced players are trying to be as clear as possible and like walk them through the gotchas as much as possible every once in a while a new player gets blasted five times on turn one and it's like look you guys got to uh it's just part of the learning experience these are the reasons why i know it sucks but you still got two more games today play them the best you can and you know you got to let people got to let people learn and get built up yeah, I mean, that was my first uh, tournament of kill team was I was playing. It was supposed to be with the Phobos strike team, but we didn't get the boxes in time. And so I had to use uh, Infiltrator uh, Compendium. And my first opponent was like the best in the local area. And he was playing pre-nerf Pathfinders and also pre-grenade nerf Pathfinders. Oof. So he's like, first activation, throws a grenade in like, almost kills three of my guys i'm like well at least you can only do that once <laughs> <laughs> oh <Wrong>. but can he <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh but you know i learned and uh he he also knew that i am a you know well i may not at the time been a kill team uh tournament player he's like well this guy plays a lot of 40k so he he understands that sometimes you just got to get your butt kicked and i learned that you know uh, but that's that's always been like one of the things I've found hard is uh, trying to bridge that gap between the okay this is a teaching element opportunity to oh no you just you know let's take this back and start over. Uh, have you had any um, Jason? Have you had any like success stories or things that you found really successful in bringing in new players into like a more competitive mindset, or maybe even just like bringing them in so that it softens the blow somewhat? Yeah, I mean, so we vary. Uh, so like a lot of the new players, there's actually a lot more new players I've found that are like out there lurking and like trying to play than will admit it. So if you mm -hmm. like actively invite them, they will show up. And then like part of the invitation is is to do stuff like, hey, we're doing like a beginner friendly night. Um, if you want to learn the game, show up and we've got a handful of people that are willing and ready to teach you. Um, and then like... You know, we we bring like a matchup. So like I give the other player uh, intercession team and then I play like compendium green skins and then I just like run around with an uh, inappropriate amount of engage orders. And I'm just like, this is a legal <laughs> shot. This is an illegal shot. Here's why. And just kind of like run through all the, the big moments there and just kind of like try to have some fun, have some drama and like intentionally not super ultra stomp them. And it's just kind of like a welcome learning tutorial game and just kind of like, you know, a fun thing to get someone in on it. And and like, you know, hopefully they get to do that at least once before they come to play some real games. Yep. Yeah, I my goal when I'm teaching a new player is to give them the rules and the in universe reason to kind of give them like a narrative hook along with the dice. It's like. Your space marine pops up around the corner by running over, and then he pulls out his gun, shoots the guy, and then he runs away. And that's why we're doing all of this stuff, to kind of give them a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, like, it, it, for me, the what's been for my best way of getting people to play Kill Team is to go to all the 40k players and be like, look how little things I have to bring in order to play Kill Team. And they're like, wow. Yeah. It is definitely a more competitive experience from 40k. From what I hear from all the 40k players who make the switch over, because you got to be way more active or like way more on top of things. It's it's weird because like 40k is not a good competitive game. <laughs> it's not. It's just a lot, like, a lot of models, a lot of everything. Uh, you know the the knowledge gap that you can have on your opponent to just that will flat out win you the game is just ridiculous. Um, and so that's what I've been uh, noticing is that it's like, oh, Kill Team is actually like a very fun competitive game that I don't feel as bad about being sweaty when, you know, in the appropriate matchups. Because, you know, 
it's even one of those things where you go, oh, Star Striders are really good right now. Well, that's 60 bucks in one week into painting. Sure. Whereas, you know, 40K, you're like, ooh, right now it's Demon Flamers. And I can buy, you know, 50, I need 15 of them. And they're selling on eBay for, you know, $70 for five. So I'll spend, you know, $210, get them all painted up in a month. And then, oh, whoops, they got nerfed. <laughs> Yeah, the cycle of meta chasing in 40k is like by the time you're ready and all invested, then like the nerf has knocked it down. I think the most recent example is plasma interceptors, right? <laughs> I <laughs> the hilarious crusade on Reddit. I don't know if anyone has seen this, but for the listeners, there was a there's a jump pack model from 40k. There was a a patch that like reduced the cost of plasma, like mass plasma on this model by like half the cost that it's supposed to be yeah and there's like a handful of people on the internet who bought a ton of them at marked up prices and then they immediately got nerfed i think like a month or two later it was, <laughs> it was yeah, like post it, on reddit with like look at all my interceptors that i just built it's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, yeah, most it was like gw was like oh sorry those plasmas weren't supposed to be free <laughs> yeah and there's some like uh for those who are trying to find Karskin, Kazrakin, however you say the 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 fancier vet guard team for uh, kill team, and had struggle with it, it wasn't because of the kill team players. It's because they were broken in forty or not broken, but very strong in forty k, and people were buying as many as they could, and then GW nerfed them as they should have been nerfed, and everyone was like, no. <laughs> Kill team people, you can have your Kasserkin back. Yeah, selling on eBay for thirty dollars, only primed. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. You know, I don't feel bad when a faction gets nerfed in Kill Team, or I'm like, oh, at worst, it's like a hundred and twenty dollars if you truly went a full like twenty man roster. And they haven't even Good like nerfed about... anything into the ground. So like, you know, no, like yeah. Vet Guard. You know, I guess they haven't even gotten nerfs. So they're not a good example. Never, like, they've never gotten a direct nerf. They've, yeah, they've so been the subject like, of the indirect nerfs around them. It's like, maybe we shouldn't have six grenades. Mm -hmm. Maybe we shouldn't have, you know, a bunch of other random things. But Vetguard are basically in an island. They just get to do whatever they want. No one will ever touch them. Yeah, I think Pathfinders uh, are probably a better example. Like, they've been really good all along, and they've gotten some direct nerfs, and they're still, like, they're still good. So, still like, playable. no one's yeah. being nerfed into the ground, and that's great. Yeah. I also it, think that Kill Team, unlike a lot of other games, uh, you can get away with bringing a not meta army and still do perfectly fine. Yeah. Luckily, Kill Team definitely still feels a game like you have to know the game well before the models make a difference. Like if you play against a really good player and you're brand new, they will just walk circles around you very slowly. <laughs> with with less good teams like it's not that crazy because it's like you'll just see more opportunities to do things so you know for players who are listening and want to be a little bit more competitive if you're in the new mexico area get out to tomas's shop play some kill team or come out to yeah. new york or come out to the come out to minnesota we've all got communities and we're all we'd all be happy to have you yeah like we're we're constantly teaching new players and uh hoping to run a little bit more events though a lot of people are distracted with 10th edition 40k, but <laughs> only so much can be done about that. Yeah, there's only so much room a shop has. Uh, anyways, Tomas, you wanna? Is there any shout outs you have at the towards yeah. the end of the podcast? My my friends would be very upset if I didn't do this because I did the, I forgot to do this in the last podcast I was on. Um, but I am part of a, a YouTube channel called Too Casual. Uh, we do currently mostly kill team. Uh, but we're going to be doing Kill Team plus a little bit of 40k in the near future. Um, but uh, so check us out on there. We relatively new, only have like a thousand subscribers, but we we're, we've been having fun doing it. Um, and then if you are in the New Mexico area, uh, uh, the local group is Bolters Con Queso, and feel free to you know join that. I am the admin on that, so you know just say Tomas sent me. In voila you'll be in um but it's a really nice community lots of you know friendly faces and generally not too many annoying people 
That's sweet. Bolter's Cone Queso, is that a, a Facebook group or a Discord? Uh, both. Sweet. The The easiest way is to get on Facebook and then get the Discord, but uh, both are uh, available. And they're both quite active. Sweet. Yeah. All right. That sounds great, Tomas. We'll make sure to put all those links in the podcast. Perfect. Thanks for coming on. No, thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. I, I always like talking about, you know, myself. It's great. Well, we were glad to That's have you. That's what the most sportsmanlike player would often do. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you guys very much. Yes. Thanks, thank man. you. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you, everyone, for listening and making it to the end of the podcast. Uh, today, we're going to introduce a little something. Um, due to all the listeners that we've had, thank you all, by the way, um, we've introduced a Patreon and a Discord. You want to talk a little bit about that, Travis? Yeah, we're going to have a Discord where we can chat with uh, anyone who wants to come in. Our goal is to help build up everyone's local communities. We have lots of experience between me and Jason. So the Discord will be the place where you can get a hold of us more easily. And the Patreon is a way to just help support us. I know it's not much and we're not asking for much, but any support goes a long way. Yes. So definitely consider that. Um, you'll find the links in the episode description. Once again, thank you for listening. Bye.